lecture ten of lectures on painting by edward armitage this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture ten on the choice of a subject before beginning to treat of the composition of a picture i should like to make some remarks on the choice of a subject of course no rule can be laid down on this matter what strikes one artist as being a very good subject will appear totally uninteresting to another it is perhaps fortunate that this should be so the taste of the general public is at least as varied as that of the profession and thus every one can be suited i remember an old gentleman who has now been dead many years but who in his day was a great patron of artists telling me that he preferred pictures with little or no subject in them he liked what he called nice satiny bits of painting and the less story there was in them to distract his attention from the satiny painting the better i fancy that this want of appreciation of composition is more common than is generally supposed for one person who notices the skill shown in the general arrangement of a picture fifty will be found to admire its colour and execution now i do not wish in any way to depreciate the charm of harmonious colour and brilliant execution of all qualities in painting they are perhaps the most captivating but they are not the alpha and omega of art i purpose therefore to devote several lectures to the study of composition and acting in conformity with the precept about first catching your hair before you proceed to cook it we will this evening review the various kinds of subjects generally chosen by artists in my lecture on the international exhibition i mentioned with disapproval a certain class of subjects much affected by the modern french school the artist seemed to have ransacked history for every incident that was most loathsome and horrible i am not at all squeamish and should not object to blood and torture occasionally but it is the morbid treatment of these ghastly subjects and their frequency which are offensive perhaps it is hardly necessary to caution english students against painting death and putrefaction they generally have a laudable desire to sell their pictures and this desire would naturally tend to keep their subjects sweet some letters on the dismal tendency of modern british art appeared in the times last autumn and certainly i am not prepared to say that the writers were wholly in the wrong but if they had had an opportunity of comparing our school with the french i think the letters would not have been written why our deathbed scenes funerals etc are positively cheerful compared with the sensational pictures of a french exhibition no whatever the faults of english pictures may be i don't think the subjects can be called dismal on the contrary i should say speaking generally that they are too frivolous pictures are constantly being painted which have little or no subject the costumes of the period are pretty the mild incident depicted happened or might have happened and these are quite sufficient reasons to many young artists for painting the picture i am far from saying that such a picture must be a bad one it may be and often is charming in colour arrangement and execution indeed the better the painting the more one regrets that so much good work should be spent on so trivial a subject before proceeding to what i have to say about the choice of a subject i would impress upon you that i only profess to give you my own opinions if any student or young artist has a great fancy for a certain subject the probability is that he will treat it better than he would one less congenial to him and i should be very sorry to dissuade him from it indeed i should be much pleased to find that he had a subject at all if there is a rock ahead for the english school it is a tendency to shirk the difficulties of composition pictures representing single figures mere models dressed up as men-at-arms milkmaids or highland lassies are much commoner now than they used to be of course in the minor exhibitions of london one expects to find plenty of work of this class but the preponderance of these subjectless figure pictures is becoming very marked even at the academy and as lecturer on painting i should be neglecting my duty if i failed to notice it it may be that these pictures pay but art is not a trade and even from a commercial point of view i would suggest that there is such a thing as overstocking the market 
the whole domain of history both sacred and profane is open to the artist besides which there are innumerable subjects which are not strictly historical but are suggested by history finally to those who prefer illustrating the poets there are homer dante shakespeare and a whole host of more modern writers surely in such a vast array it cannot be difficult to dig out good subjects suitable to every mind many subjects are too hastily rejected because they have already been painted when probably a new reading is very possible or by slightly altering the moment chosen the subject assumes another aspect in a former lecture i mentioned as a familiar instance the parable of the good samaritan here is a trite and hackneyed subject enough every one has painted it and yet it would be very possible by altering the moment depicted to give a new version of it take the moment when the good samaritan entrusts the wounded traveller to the care of the innkeeper and leaves him money adding that whatever more he may spend will be repaid him and you have a capital subject which has never to my knowledge been painted again imagine the return of the samaritan after a few days absence and the gratitude of the injured man now nearly restored to health and you have another first-rate subject as an extreme example take the holy family how often has this subject been painted raphael alone painted it over thirty times and i should think that there are at least a thousand original holy families in existence and yet the subject seems to me as fresh as ever the reason of this is because it embodies the purest form of maternal love in the same way that the good samaritan illustrates human kindness maternal love and humanity are many-sided and hence the subjects which illustrate them will be many-sided too some artists shrink from taking known subjects from a laudable modesty they could not think of entering into rivalry with raphael or andre del sarto i deem this modesty unnecessary provided they bestow on their work original thought and invention if they attempt to rival the manner of the great masters then they may be taxed with presumption but no artist need be deterred from painting such subjects as the last supper or the walk to emmaus because many great masters have treated the same themes i have probably said enough in defence of taking subjects which have already been painted and will now attempt some classification of subjects suitable for the higher class of figure pictures the term religious in connection with art ought i think to be confined to those subjects in which divine personages are introduced or to those which embody some miracle thus the creation of adam the holy family the raising of lazarus or the conversion of st paul would all come under the head of religious subjects but i think the term misapplied when speaking of such subjects as hagar in the desert the finding of moses samson and delilah etc which have no religious element in them although they are of course strictly scriptural it is almost needless for me to remark that the old and new testament offer an inexhaustible field for pictorial illustration the bible is more read and better known than any other book in the world and this alone would preeminently distinguish it as a source whence artists should derive subjects for their pictures but besides this the costumes from noah down to st paul are simple and dignified suggesting the highest style of art there are reasons which militate against young artists or old ones either attempting this highest class of religious subjects the principle of which is the fear of failure failure in this class being a much greater humiliation than in a lower walk of art but there is also another good reason and that is the want of a market for their work our churches do not as a rule purchase biblical pictures and our lay patrons of art naturally enough object to importing a crucifixion or a noli me tangere into galleries and rooms full of mundane subject pictures there seems however no reason why the second class of scriptural subjects those i mean which are simply historical or anecdotic should not be more often painted than they are of allegory and allegorical subjects i need hardly say anything 
for mere decorative purposes they may sometimes be eligible but even then i think them quite out of date and should be sorry to see a revival of the painted riddles which were so much the fashion in the time of giotto and his followers such semi-allegorical subjects as reynolds garrick between tragedy and comedy are permissible enough because they are easily comprehended but the allegories i object to are those which are totally incomprehensible without a page or two of letterpress to explain their meaning mythology offers a much better field than allegory for decorative purposes juno in her peacock drawn car ascending to olympus orpheus and eurydice prometheus victus etc are all splendid subjects there is a bourgeois objection to them on the ground that nobody now cares for juno or any of the heathen gods and demigods but i should like to ask these objectors if they think that any one cares now for the vicar of wakefield and his family or for tom jones and his sophia and yet pictures illustrative of these old-fashioned novels are painted every day and often meet with great success it is quite a mistake to suppose that in order to admire or appreciate pictures we must take a lively interest in the biography of the dramatis personae jove mars venus and hercules are of interest to us now just as they probably were to the athenians in the time of phidias and praxiteles namely as representatives of power courage beauty and strength and so long as these qualities are valued by the human race so long will their personifications continue to be interesting historical subjects may be divided into two classes one those where the interest is solely derived from the rank or historical importance of the personages depicted two those which from their nature are dramatically interesting independently of the names of the personages what are commonly called official pictures belong to the first class such as coronations royal marriages and ceremonials of all descriptions such pictures as turberg's council of trent and others of the same kind belong to this category because all the interest of the work lies in the faithful portraiture of the figures deprive the figures of their historical importance and all interest in the subject as a subject vanishes of course the picture may have technical excellences which may make it interesting and valuable but this has nothing to do with the point at issue any trivial incident from the domestic lives of queen elizabeth charles i cromwell frederick the great etc specimens of which are to be found in every exhibition belong essentially to this class of subjects i would hardly class our old friend alfred minding the cakes with these subjects simply because he did not mind them and the contrast between the disguised monarch's thoughtful and anxious look and the humble task to which he had been set is sufficiently interesting per se had he done his task cleverly and toasted the muffins to a turn this time-honoured but apocryphal subject would have been a good specimen of the class i am speaking of the following are a few more subjects which will illustrate my meaning milton dictating a paradise lost to his daughters francis i picking up titian's brush sir isaac newton watching an apple fall hampton refusing to pay ship money in all these and similar subjects you will observe that no human passions are concerned the only reason for painting them at all is either because such famous men as titian francis i and milton are engaged in them or because they led to very important scientific and political consequences as in the falling apple and the ship money instances i would give as instances of the second class of historical subjects the death of seneca charlemagne crossing the alps caesar landing in britain queen Boadicea haranguing the iceni these are all well known and indeed rather hackneyed subjects but they will serve as examples of what i mean there is a certain dramatic quality about them which fits them for pictorial treatment independently of the particular history attached to each and these are in my opinion the best kind of historical subjects events which do not concern the life of any particular person are also very pictorial provided always there is plenty of the dramatic element in them
a man escaping to a city of refuge a departure of emigrants a rescue from fire launching the lifeboat return from victory are all eminently suitable for painting and yet there are no kings and queens nor even distinguished statesmen poets or philosophers to be introduced there are human interests of various kinds to be excited and this is quite enough war episodes are always interesting we do not care to know the exact spot or date of the engagement we have no curiosity about the names of the combatants nor even much about their nationality the scene itself is sufficiently exciting without any accompanying explanation it is true that there are plenty of highly uninteresting battle pictures but the fault lies with the treatment and not with the subject in selecting a subject no matter whether from mythology scripture history fiction or everyday life care should be taken to choose one which has unity of action there ought to be a story in your subject but not more than one story in your secondary groups you may have separate action and by-play but they ought somehow to be connected with the main story of the picture and instead of distracting the attention from the subject they ought rather to assist in concentrating it where there is more than one centre of interest in a picture the effect dramatically speaking is weakened the old masters often disregarded the tolerably self-evident rule the famous transfiguration picture of raphael is a well-known instance in point the interest is divided between the transfiguration proper and the demoniac boy although some of the figures are pointing upward yet the faces are all turned toward the demoniac and he is certainly the principal focus of interest this blemish in raphael's picture is all the more unaccountable as no mention is anywhere made of a demoniac having been present at the time and the old masters especially those of the german schools abound in incongruities of this kind i remember seeing somewhere a picture of the martyrdom of st lorenzo the saint is about to be roasted alive but the largest and most prominent figure in the picture is one of the executioners who is making a horrible face having got some of the smoke in his eye the introduction of these irrelevant and grotesque episodes cannot be justified however well they may be painted and if it be granted that it is undesirable to select a subject in which there is more than one centre of interest how much more objectionable is it to invent disturbing incidents which are not recorded in the text of the subject as an extreme instance of a bad selection of subjects i have always thought that nothing could beat shakespeare's seven ages of man the lines suggest seven distinct subjects having no connection whatever with each other each is very good of its kind to attempt to amalgamate them all into one picture is quite absurd the result is extremely unpleasant suggesting a company of strolling players each rehearsing his part or perhaps the courtyard of a medieval lunatic asylum in justice to mulready i ought to mention that he did not select the seven ages of man as a subject for his picture he had the impossible task imposed upon him by a liberal but injudicious patron for decorative work for a frieze for instance such subjects as the seven ages of man are well suited because each age can be treated separately forming as it were a picture of itself the only bond of union between the seven being that the figures should be of the same proportion and should be similar in style and execution another good rule to observe in selecting a subject is to choose one which has illustrative action in it what i mean by this is that the action of the figures should be sufficient to explain the subject you cannot put words issuing from their mouths as is done in caricature you must therefore explain your story by action and expression we will take as examples two not dissimilar subjects one shall be a meeting of conspirators and the other a conference of philosophers of course i don't mean to insinuate that there is any analogy between philosophers and conspirators but that in both cases we have five or six figures seated round a table 
in the first we should represent our conspirators in close conclave leaning over the table with their heads near together one or two perhaps grasping their daggers another looking round anxiously in short it would be very evident from the expression and attitude of the figures that they were about some villainous work if we now turn to the other subject the conference of philosophers how are we to express the purport of their conversation what facial muscles are called into play when men are talking metaphysics or expounding their theories of evolution it is clear that however exquisite the execution of the picture may be the subject of it will be unintelligible without explanation and even with the necessary elucidation it will be inferior to the conspirators in dramatic interest the subject i gave you in the life school some time ago i mean peter's denial of christ is an eminently good one because if properly treated it is impossible to mistake the meaning of the figures the menacing interrogatory of the woman peter's alarm for his personal safety and the jeers of the soldiers who are sitting round the fire are all well adapted for pictorial expression any one who had never read the new testament an unconverted chinaman for instance would say at once this young woman is taxing a middle-aged man with something he denies but there is such downright assertion in her action and such fear mixed up with his denial that the accusation whatever it is must be true no subject can be called a really good one which requires a long explanation to make it intelligible thus subjects in which the figures are assuming characters which do not properly belong to them are unfit for painting for example in the conspirators just mentioned it might very well have happened that to conceal their sinister designs they assumed the mask of joviality but you should not select this particular phase of the story on the stage this kind of make-believe is managed by an aside the actor takes the audience into his confidence when he says here comes the king let us dissemble and accordingly for the next ten minutes or so you are to understand that he is not the obsequious sycophant he pretends to be and lest by chance you should forget that he is dissembling he will come forward and frown clench his fist or point contemptuously over his shoulder at his fellow-actor who strangely enough never seems to see these ominous gestures all this is understood and accepted on the stage but it does not do in a picture i would therefore advise you as much as possible to choose subjects which can be understood at a glance let your personages appear in their natural characters and not assuming parts which do not belong to them acts of mercy such as clothing the naked feeding the hungry visiting the sick etc are all good subjects because the meaning is explained directly by the action of the figures speaking for myself i have but little sympathy with subjects taken from works of fiction the artist who selects them for pictorial treatment seems to me to abnegate whatever creative power he may possess and to become an illustrator or translator of other men's thoughts homer dante and milton are of course exceptional poets their creations are heroic and the personifications of their heroes would be either nude or sternly classical besides they never descend to minute particulars and the artist is left very much to his own invention the more detail an author gives and the more picturesque the detail the less fitted are his works for picture figures scott and dickens are eminently unpaintable that is it is a hopeless task to illustrate them pictures taken from their works are always disappointing the ivanhoes the mrs gumps and the pecksniffs of our imagination are always superior to their effigies on canvas and this is more or less the case with the personages of shakespeare cervantes and moliere costume has a great deal to do with the choice of a subject and this no doubt is the reason why the works of shakespeare cervantes and moliere are such favourite hunting grounds for artists if the prince of denmark had been a modern heir apparent attired in a frock coat tweed trousers and a chimney-pot hat or if malvolio had worn the dress of an ordinary british butler we might not often see them painted 
for one picture taken from thackeray's modern novels we find dozens illustrating tennyson's idols of the king or his holy grail now although the question of costume must always be an important factor in the selection of a subject it ought not to be the only one a picture should not be painted merely for the sake of the costumes this seemed to me the principal fault in the large austrian pictures of the international exhibition and i may add that it is a fault which is not altogether unknown in england there is one more class of subjects which i have not yet noticed and that is the domestic or genre class the pictures in short of everyday life pictures of this kind are much less dependent on a good choice of subject than those which illustrate some historical incident they are generally prized for the brilliancy and harmony of their colour or for the delicacy of their execution and if these qualities exist in a high degree the subject is a minor consideration still it ought to be a consideration and in choosing subjects of this class you should prefer those which are typical of the personages you have to represent if you attempt rustic pictures not only should your figures look like peasants but the subject should be thoroughly bucolic a dirty ploughman plodding wearily homeward along a muddy lane on a dull november evening seems commonplace and prosaic enough and yet the subject would not be deficient in pictorial interest it would be typical of the man's hard and comfortless life it would be in perfect harmony with his furrowed face his bony limbs and his stooping gait it would not only represent that particular ploughman in that particular lane but it would give a true though mournful impression of farm labourers generally i should much prefer for the subject of a picture a common episode from the life of a labourer to an uncommon one again if i wished to represent the same man at home i should endeavour without exaggeration to give the squalor of his surroundings and should not out of my inner consciousness evolve an ideal peasant surrounded by a comely family and looking as dickens has somewhere said as if he had spent his little all in soap artists understand pretty well nowadays that in painting rustic subjects honesty is the best policy the great success of the french painter millet was due entirely to his uncompromising honesty of purpose and to the unerring judgment with which he selected his subjects there are pretty girls even in france amongst the peasant class although they are certainly rare there are plenty of fete days when every woman makes herself as smart as she can but millet knew better than to paint pretty girls in smart dresses instead of this he depicted the true types of french peasantry gaunt hard-featured women dressed in the coarsest garments and shod with wooden sabots the novelty of truth was unwelcome at first to the parisian public they had so long been accustomed to opera comique peasants that they had lost relish for the genuine article but by degrees they began to perceive that these uncouth figures were very like the jeans and the victoires they knew a la campagne moreover they did not fail to observe that the subjects chosen by the artist were of that homely agricultural kind peculiar to the french peasantry they smelt of the village dunghill and this was the great secret of their success i am often told by people who don't know much about art that they have thought of such a capital subject for a picture and it generally turns out to be something odd or incongruous and not at all fitted for painting for several years we have had pictures sent in for exhibition representing children playing at judge and jury police courts auctions etc in these pictures the children are all dressed up to represent policemen barristers plaintiffs and defendants moreover they have so thoroughly learned their parts that their action is no longer childlike some of these pictures are very well painted but the principle is so wrong and false that we now invariably refuse them admission children should in a picture be engaged on something childlike thus it would be perfectly natural for children to play at being wild beasts making use of any bear or wolf skin which happened to be handy coach and horses hen and chickens are again legitimate games for children and therefore proper for painting 
but in the arts we don't want elaborately got up burlesque a group of young children on the sea sands at work with their wooden shovels would by some be thought a stupid kind of subject hardly worthy of being painted at all but make the same children overtaken by the tide with a steep cliff behind them and probably you will have a great success especially if you make your little figures expressing their fear or courage in a theatrical and unchildlike manner the first group would be a typical one typical of the seaside and childhood the second would not be absolutely impossible like the bewigged and behelmeted youngsters above mentioned but it would be somewhat exceptional and therefore in my opinion not so suitable for painting as the first group in the same way with landscape the spot you select for pitching your umbrella should not be mean and ugly neither should it be overpoweringly grand and beautiful pictures representing the falls of niagara or the gorges of the rocky mountains are generally failures i have in a former lecture praised the belgian landscape painters and i think that a good deal of their merit lies in the happy choice of subjects they are certainly not classical like the old school of french landscape painters nor do they affect the dreariest commonplace like some of the moderns they neither paint precipices and snowy mountains nor dull stretches of poplar skirted high road their pictures are to me most interesting not only on account of their technical excellence but from the good taste shown in the selection of the subjects incidents which are out of harmony with the character of the persons engaged form capital materials for caricature the late john leach showed the nicest discrimination in his selection of subjects when he gave us pictures of character nothing could be better than his sporting scenes or his bits from the mining districts when he wanted to raise a laugh at something paradoxical he would give us a lot of mutes making merry after a respectable funeral or a used-up swell eating periwinkles with a pin on the top of a bus in both these cases it was the sharp contrast between the usual habits of the persons and their exceptional occupation at the time which made the fun and very good fun it was too but in an oil picture which takes some months to paint the humour ought to be of a more delicate kind i know of no better example of the kind of humour i mean than wilkie's blind fiddler before closing my lecture i should wish to notice a certain kind of pictures which do not fit in well with any of the classes i have mentioned the pictures i mean are those which are painted expressly to teach some lesson or to inculcate some moral precept the great originator of this kind of art was hogarth before him nothing of the sort had ever been done and since his death no artist has equalled him in this particular line much however as i admire hogarth as a painter i cannot coincide with all the praise that has been showered on him as a great moral teacher he has often been compared to moliere but the great frenchman attacked the vices and follies of his day with a sharp rapier whereas hogarth wielded a heavy bludgeon indeed i think it very doubtful whether our art can be converted into an active agent in the cause of morality the touches of ridicule which a clever writer uses with so much effect are very apt to become ponderous when embedded in oil paint hogarth's reputation may well be allowed to rest on his numerous technical excellences without hoisting him upon a pedestal as a great apostle of morality in like manner the name of cruikshank will be preserved as the clever draughtsman and caricaturist and not as the champion of teetotalism in mitigation however of hogarth's sledgehammer style of belabouring vice we must bear in mind that the age in which he lived was a very gross and brutal one and that his rake's progress his marriage a la mode and similar works which to us appear exaggerated or caricatured were considered by his contemporaries to be very true to nature to return to the proper business this evening which is not to criticise painters and their work but to discuss subjects for painting i cannot say i particularly delight in the class under notice whoever takes up these subjects becomes involuntarily perhaps a kind of missionary agent for the cause he takes up 
whether it be teetotalism humanitarianism or the redressing of the wrongs of our old friend the poor governess and as with some other agents his zeal often outruns his discretion and he is apt to thrust forward his moral too obtrusively when this kind of a picture is painted in pairs after the fashion of hogarth's industrious and idle apprentice there is a sort of poster or advertisement flavour about the work reminding one a little of what i was and what i am in connection with mrs allen's hair wash or of before and after using anti-fat no one can of course object to such antithetic pictures as summer and winter peace and war youth and age etc but where the practice of showing both sides of the metal becomes objectionable is when the work is evidently intended to be didactic i don't know what effect these didactic pictures may have on others but i always feel a kind of impatience at having the contrast between virtue and vice thrust before me in this infant school fashion i do not wish in these lectures to enter upon the domain of high art ethics i have a very decided aversion to the union of painting with abstruse theories of all kinds but a few words on morality in art may not be out of place it must be generally allowed that certain pictures have an immoral tendency we may therefore conclude by analogy that others have a moral tendency but beyond this general truism it is difficult to get the art-loving portion of the public needs no lord chamberlain to ostracize immoral subjects but on the other hand it is rather intolerant of what are called goody pictures let us rather instead of preaching homilies with our brush endeavour to set an example of pictorial morality by adherence to truth by abstaining from claptrap tricks and meretricious execution by ceasing to pilfer ideas and modes of painting from other artists and by general honesty of purpose if we do this we may rest assured that our work will have a healthier influence than it would have if more directly enlisted in the cause of morality end of lecture ten lecture eleven of lectures on painting by edward armitage this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven on the composition of decorative and historical pictures the art of composing figure pictures may be divided into two categories to each of which i intend devoting a lecture the first category will comprise all decorative or semi-decorative work where grandeur and harmony of line is the great desideratum the graphic rendering of the subject being of minor importance the second category would include almost all easel pictures which aspire to represent some historical event or to illustrate some anecdote in these pictures the graphic rendering of the subject is the first desideratum and the pleasant harmony of line only the second we will deal this evening with the laws of composition for decorative work i ought perhaps to avoid using the word laws art is not an exact science and no strict law can be laid down about a matter of taste still there are certain principles which seem to be accepted by all masters of composition and certain others which although not generally accepted occur to me as likely to be of use to you the golden rule for the arrangement of figures in a picture is that the nature of the subject ought to dictate the lines of the composition if you have to paint a subject of a quiet majestic and dignified class a subject for all ages where you wish to express perfect repose and stability you cannot do better than go back to the pyramid this pyramidical theory of composition has been much quizzed and laughed at but that is because the old-fashioned dilettante who advocated it wanted to apply it universally now it is clearly unsuitable for subjects of action or for filling with pictures long low panels but for altarpieces or for pictures which are destined for central places it is at once the most natural and the most effective method the quiet and serene dignity of many of the ancient holy families and other subjects of sacred art is due mainly to the pyramidical form of grouping 
sometimes the form is that of a truncated pyramid as in the hemicycle of the ecole des beaux-arts where the object of the painter was to represent an ideal areopagus of art in the compositions of masaccio and filippino lippi we have good examples of a horizontal style of arrangement the structure of these groups is suggestive of solid simple architectural forms and has a kind of dignity of its own but though suitable enough for frescoes of the fifteenth century it is hardly picturesque or varied enough for modern oil pictures mural paintings particularly when they represent grave or sacred subjects should more or less partake of this horizontal and rectilineal form of composition a certain amount of deviation is necessary and it is in fixing the limit of this deviation that the skill of the artist is shown too little would make his composition formal and lifeless too much would take away from the symmetry which befits such subjects the stanza of raphael are noble examples of skill and taste in composition nothing can be finer than his school of athens his parnassus and his theology here we find a variety of line combined with a dignified simplicity it is the arrangement and composition of these grand frescoes which in my opinion justifies the position raphael holds in the history of art rather than the beauty of his madonnas or the bold drawings of his somewhat overrated cartoons later artists of the roman school overdid the picturesque element and lost the stately simplicity which characterizes the second manner of raphael in modern times ang's apotheosis of homer is a good example of what a mural painting should be severe in drawing and dignified in composition it is yet by no means deficient in those more attractive qualities which are commonly expressed by the word picturesque flandrin's frieze at st vincent de paul is another magnificent specimen of an exquisite sense of fitness there is hardly a figure in the whole procession of apostles saints and martyrs which could be improved i know of no modern work which is so perfect of its kind it is of course preposterous to suppose that good composition can be taught in a couple of evenings but if i succeed in impressing on you the importance of this rather neglected branch of study i shall not have lectured in vain we will begin with the simplest problem namely how to fill up with figures an elongated rectangular space or frieze the most obvious method is to set up a row of figures of the same size and all in profile as was done by the ancient egyptians now this mode of treatment though suitable enough for the nile temples would obviously be unfit for buildings of the nineteenth century the figure should preserve a certain regularity a certain frieze-like arrangement and yet the attitude should be varied and the work should not look as if it had been done by machinery the first improvement on the egyptian method would be to break the monotony by here and there grouping two or even three figures together as in these groups of two or three one figure must be behind the others and therefore farther off from the spectator it would be smaller the head would be lower and you would at once get a little variety in the line of heads to vary your line of heads simply by arguing that some people are six feet high whilst others are only five does not answer in decorative painting you may assume that the male figures are bigger than the female but you must proceed as if your men were all the same or very nearly of the same height and your women ought also to vary very little in stature children you may introduce of any size from the infant in arms to the youth or maiden of fifteen but let them be unmistakably children and not little men and women the individual action of the figures would of course depend very much on the destination of the work if it were intended for the decoration of a church the figures would of course represent patriarchs apostles or martyrs and a severe and simple arrangement would be necessary if on the other hand your frieze were to decorate a theatre or ballroom the figures should have more action and naturally the lines would be more broken whatever the subject however whether maskers musicians or morris dancers there should be a certain frieze-like symmetry in the composition you should never forget that you are engaged on a decorative work and not on an easel picture
a rule which it is well to observe in all decorative work is to avoid cutting off any portion of the figures this is quite unavoidable in many easel pictures if you have a crowd of people to represent you cannot isolate some of them so completely that no portion of the others should be visible an easel or a gallery picture is bounded on every side by the frame and the eye is not shocked at all by seeing portions of the figures cut off although every one knows that the figures do not extend behind the frame yet it is easy to suppose that they do and the eye allows itself to be cheated into this belief but in decorative or mural painting there is no solid framework round the picture isolating it from the surrounding wall there may be an ornamental border or possibly a light moulding but this is not enough to permit the practice michelangelo in his decorations of the sistine chapel often carried his figures and draperies right out of the panels allotted to them and this boldness adds to the grand free character of the work the problem of how to fill up the irregular shaped wall spaces which continually occur both in gothic and palladian architecture is of course more complex these spaces have generally curved sides and in many of them as for instance the spandrels of arches the curve is concave straight horizontal lines of heads which are generally so desirable for long rectilinear spaces here become very objectionable bold convex outlines for the groups and an arrangement for the heads which does not suggest either horizontal or vertical lines ought to be the rule in these cases nothing can be finer than michelangelo's treatment of the sibyls and prophets in the sistine chapel there is a majestic dignity about them which is due rather to their full convex outlines than to their colossal proportions on the other hand in many of the compositions by the early florentines we have long horizontal rows of heads which seem out of harmony with the arched space they fill the circular nimbi take off somewhat from the meagre character of these lines and there is considerable beauty about the individual figures but viewed as decorative works they are very unsatisfactory it is of course impossible to devise rules for all conditions of decorative and historical painting but a few general hints may be useful to you first beware of concave lines for the outlines of your groups second avoid sharp angles and particularly right angles unless you wish to draw special attention to them third be very careful about the relative position of the heads so that viewed as points of interest they do not form any regular geometrical pattern these three rules seem to me the most important ones to be observed in the composition of decorative figure pictures and we will examine them a seriatim the first rule i have given is to avoid concave forms for the general outline of the group there is no rule without exceptions and to this one there are a good many still it will be found that speaking generally convex outlines give grandeur wherever they are introduced this convexity in the form of the groups need not be dependent on the outlines of the figures themselves it may be got by introducing drapery or other accessories i know of no example showing the value of full convex outlines more strikingly than the madonna di san sisto in the pictures of the umbrian school on the contrary we find extreme poverty of line the figures themselves are not particularly attenuated but they are not sufficiently connected together nor enveloped in those useful pieces of flowing drapery which give such grandeur and fullness to the works of fra bartolomeo sebastian del piombo and other painters of the roman school i have in former lectures entered fully into the subject of convex lines being almost always associated with forward movement and concave with retreat and need not go over the same ground again i would however observe that the terms of boldness and convexity are almost synonymous when applied to outline thus when we speak of a mountain having a bold outline we mean that though steep and precipitous it is bluff or convex in form a mountain with a depression on the top or surmounted by a sharp-pointed cone would hardly ever be noted for its bold outline 
the second rule to which i wish to call your attention is the avoidance of right angles in the composition of your figures all angles unless they be obtuse ones are to be deprecated but the most objectionable of all are the right angles in a single figure rectangular outlines are not so unpleasant but i cannot agree with those who think that the big seated egyptian figures with which we are all familiar owe their grandeur to their rectangular contour i have no doubt but that these gigantic figures in their native swamp and illumined by an egyptian moon would look very imposing but the solemn grandeur of their aspect would be due to their size and to their surroundings and not to their harsh rectangular outline if the moses of michelangelo could be magnified to the size of these figures and transported to the banks of the nile i fully believe he would be far more impressive simplicity and grandeur are often bracketed together as though the terms were almost synonymous but they certainly are not so the street and chapel architecture of the georgian era was simple even to baldness but no one can call it grand it is not however in single figures that right angles are so much to be avoided as in complicated groups of several figures here they arrest and distract the eye giving harshness to the composition and destroying the look of spontaneous action and easy flowing movement which figures always should have rubens in his descent from the cross has avoided these disagreeable angles but in many of his more careless compositions where there is violent action they are painfully conspicuous in spite of his liberal use of flying draperies hence his cavalry skirmishes though full of violence and contortion are quite wanting in spontaneous go right angles in a group of figures convey the idea of immovability hence although generally undesirable it is well sometimes to introduce them thus a kneeling warrior firmly planted to resist onslaught might with propriety have both knees right angles in this case we wish to give the idea of fixture and therefore rectangular forms are not only allowable but very useful again in the case of a wounded man endeavouring to raise himself the angle formed by his right arm might with propriety be a right angle because we want to show that the man is wounded and cannot raise himself without difficulty if he were uninjured and in full possession of his strength we ought to represent his springing up in some other way in the very frequent case of two arms crossing each other they should not cross at right angles there is no reason here for expressing immovability at the point where the arms cross and therefore the formality of right angles should be avoided we will now pass on to the third rule namely that relating to the heads of the figures whatever the subject of the picture the eye is always attracted to the heads it is therefore of the highest importance that their relative position should be carefully considered in the annexed diagram it is of no use arguing that one of the heads is a full face another three-quarters a third a profile and the fourth a back view of the head the four heads are all points of interest they are equidistant and placed on a segment of the same circle and turn them whichever way you will you cannot get rid of the unpleasantness of the arrangement so long as you keep them in their present relative positions in the next figure we have four heads suggesting a quadrilateral or lozenge shape this is also very objectionable and it is a case of frequent occurrence in both these diagrams by shifting the position of one of the heads we should break up the symmetrical arrangement which so much offends the cultivated eye there is no objection in a composition of many figures to placing two or more heads on the same horizontal line indeed in many cases it is most advantageous to do so but what ought to be avoided is having heads on the same vertical line if you have a kneeling or sitting figure in front of an erect one arrange your kneeling figure so that the one head shall not be perpendicularly below the other if you have two erect figures arrange your kneeling figure so that the head shall not come on the same vertical line as either of the other heads or halfway between the two
i might argue a good deal more about the extreme importance of a picturesque and irregular arrangement of the heads but i have probably said enough to call your attention to this very prominent feature in good designing and will now give a few hints about other kindred matters converging lines are to be avoided unless there is something of interest to which you wish to direct attention at the point of convergence this is by no means an exaggerated specimen of the evil but the effect of these four arms all converging toward one point is unpleasant if the personages were disputing over a manuscript or trying to clutch a bag of gold lying on the table then the manuscript or the gold would be the centre of interest in the picture and converging lines would not only be excusable but absolutely necessary where there is nothing of particular interest at the point where the lines meet the eye feels disappointed at being misled although converging lines are generally to be avoided it often happens that a repetition of the same kind of curve gives force and unity of purpose to a group observe the convex curves formed by the backs of these suppliants their repetition gives unity of purpose a perpendicular kneeling figure might individually be just as expressive but as one of a group he would take away somewhat from the general character of unity in supplication one of the most difficult problems the designer of large mural pictures has to solve is to introduce with good effect raised arms and hands especially when they belong to the background figures when possible it is better to keep them out of sight altogether but in some subjects you would by so doing inevitably lose expression and animation and it becomes necessary to introduce here and there an upraised arm with extended hand this is easy enough to do if you are reckless about the lines of your composition but if you are fastidious it is a very difficult problem in the first place they distract the eye destroying the full bold outline of your groups and secondly there is a comic element about them which it is rather difficult to avoid when as in many of raphael's logi the whole of the figures which are raising their arms are seen the effect is bad and trivial but there is nothing particularly comical about it when however an arm crops up here and there from the unseen figures of the background it is difficult to avoid the ludicrous cases may occur when a whole forest of hands will have to be raised as in an oath of allegiance but here the action of raising the arms is inseparable from the subject my remarks apply only to upraised arms as indicative of wonder joy or grief all these hints about designing may appear to some of you rather far-fetched but if ever you get experience in decorative painting i think you will find they are not far from the truth the art of good grouping is not of spontaneous growth you may have a general idea of how you are to fill your canvas or wall space and that idea may be a good one but all the details of the groups have to be worked out bit by bit a change in the attitude of one figure will be almost sure to entail a change in a good many others and it often happens that after giving yourself a good deal of trouble you will have to go back to your first idea a conscientious and fastidious designer may be compared to an arctic explorer picking his way in an ice pack he will have to draw through one ice barrier to blow up another with gunpowder to circumvent a third and when after surmounting all these difficulties he thinks his course clear and open water at hand he may have to retrace his steps and seek some other channel i am perfectly aware that in painting small easel pictures all this groping after fine lines may be unnecessary nay even detrimental to the lifelike spirit of the composition our own correspondence sketches at the seat of war if done on the spot which i am afraid they not always are will be not only more interesting but better composed than if he had sat at home and trusted to his imagination but in this lecture i am not dealing with easel pictures and realistic subjects and i repeat that in decorative figure painting excellence can only be obtained by a continuous process of altering modifying adding and omitting 
in the same way that the lines and general grouping of a picture should be arranged with a view to expressing the subject with dignity and grandeur so the management of light and shade should tend toward the same end and it is impossible to lay down strict rules for light and shade as for outline designing didactic writers on art will tell you that the principal light ought to fall on the principal figure fair in the front in all the blaze of light the hero of thy piece should meet the sight sir joshua reynolds remarks very justly on this piece of doggerel that there is no necessity for the principal figure to be placed in the middle of the picture or receive the principal light he goes on to say that this conduct if always observed would reduce the art of composition to too great a uniformity and that it is sufficient if the place he holds or the attention of the other figures to him denote him the hero of the piece in works which partake strongly of a decorative character this axiom about fair in the front in all the blaze of light for the principal figure may be tolerably true but in historical figures something more unforeseen is wanted in the often painted subject of the death of caesar i should be very much inclined to put the caesar in the shade and the tyrannicides with their flashing daggers in the light it appears to me that to throw a shade over the face of the prostrate emperor would somehow or other convey the idea of the shadow of death which is overspreading him and the reproachful et tu brute would come with greater pathos from a figure half veiled in shadow than from one in broad daylight we will suppose now that instead of having the death of caesar to paint we have the stoning of st stephen the subject is analogous the young man named saul and the jewish executioners of stephen were not common assassins any more than the murderers of caesar shall we therefore adopt the same plan with the figure of stephen as we did with that of caesar and put him in the shade i say certainly not stephen was the first christian martyr we read that his face was as that of an angel and he ought to be surrounded by an angelic halo of light and this treatment need not be dictated by the text we should come to the same conclusion simply on the grounds of pictorial fitness stephen was a voluntary martyr and gloried in his own death caesar was assassinated much against his will and although we are told that he covered his face with his toga and died with dignity yet he certainly cannot be called a martyr i have introduced these two subjects to show you how hopeless it is to attempt to lay down general rules such as old du fresnoy gives us in his poem on the art of painting every new theme you undertake to illustrate ought to have a treatment special to itself if you wish to produce a fresh and original picture when the master of a vessel is starting on a voyage he would not steer southwest by west one half west because that happened to be the course he steered the last time he was at sea nor would he run up his skyscrapers and set his studding sails because he carried on his light canvas the last voyage out he would consult his chart the state of the tide the direction of the wind and act accordingly in short for this new voyage the condition of the wind tide and barometer being new he would give new orders to his mate and crew substituting the brain for the master the hand for the mate and the brushes for the crew we ought to set about our pictures much in the same way after giving the subject of light and shade a good deal of thought it appears to me that there is only one rule which invariably applies to all pictures and that is that there should be a uniform scale of tone throughout the work the gradient from light to shade may be very steep as in rembrandt or very gentle as in p Varanese, but this gradient or transition should not be abrupt in one part of the picture and gentle in another the whole work whatever scale you adopt should be homogeneous sir joshua reynolds and others have endeavoured to ascertain the proportion of light to shade in the works of the old masters i believe these experimental blots have been made rather with a view to black and white than legitimate light and shade 
but whatever their object i don't think that any theory can be built up on them i am convinced that what the old masters called the chiaroscuro of their pictures was a matter of feeling and sometimes of accident but never of calculation theorists often talk learnedly about secondary and tertiary lights but the artist never dreamt of them they are nothing more than the efforts he has made and the means to which he has resorted in order to connect the highest light of his principal group with the gloom of his background rembrandt's vigorous light and shade and correggio's luminous breadth ought to be ascribed to the natural idiosyncrasies of the painters intensified probably by the conditions under which their works were executed they were assuredly not the results of calculation or learning modern artists are often credited by their critics with subtleties of which they are perfectly innocent they introduce into their pictures certain harmonies of tone or colour by a kind of pictorial instinct but certainly not in obedience to theoretical laws in designing a composition of many figures it is natural to begin with the principal group or centre of interest when you have got this satisfactorily arranged you proceed with the less important figures and it is here that beginners and some who are by no means beginners often come to grief they get a fine action or a noble attitude for some accessory figure and they are so much in love with it that they must introduce it whether it is in keeping with the principal group or not it may viewed as a single figure be very good and yet be injurious to the general harmony of the composition recollect that accessory figures however good in themselves if they mar the general effect ought to be sacrificed by so doing you will doubtless raise a cry of lamentation from your friends they will say what could have induced you to have scraped out that figure why it was the best thing in the picture and so on to which you might reply that you did not want it to be the best thing in the picture and therefore you erased it it was this tendency to introduce some favourite figure where it was not wanted which rather mars raphael's latest manner as exemplified in the transfiguration and in the incendio del borgo and what in raphael was only an incipient tendency became a confirmed habit in the work of his imitators sir joshua reynolds in his discourses is continually urging the student of composition to think how the old masters would have treated the subject he is engaged upon and advises him to imitate their style and manner indeed the sixth discourse is devoted entirely to this principle of imitation now if we were vastly superior to michelangelo raphael and titian and uh, held the same relative position to them that they did to their predecessors i could understand our occasionally adopting their figures after greatly improving them but as we should not be likely to improve any figures we had appropriated we had much better leave the old masters alone plagiarism or to use a plainer word stealing can only be excused when the plagiarist makes a better use of the property he has appropriated than the original possessor did sir joshua certainly says that you should imitate and not copy servilely imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and if filippino lippi could have seen raphael transferring his st paul into the famous cartoon of the saint preaching at athens no doubt he would have felt flattered but how about raphael is it not true that this plagiarism on raphael's part detracts somewhat from his fame does not every one on seeing the carmine chapel in florence and recognizing the familiar figure of st paul think somewhat more of filippino lippi and somewhat less of raphael i believe that nothing can be more fatal to the career of an artist than intentional imitation of another man's work i say intentional because we are all more or less imitators quite unconsciously we often confound a reminiscence of something we have seen in the picture with a reminiscence of nature and so become unconscious imitators but this is a very different thing from deliberately setting aside our own ideas and endeavouring to fancy what would be the ideas of some one else 
it may be argued that sir joshua reynolds addressed his advice to students and not to mature artists but the habit of imitating others when once acquired is not easily got rid of a certain degree of excellence might doubtless be attained by following this method provided the masters imitated are excellent but after all it is only a kind of reflected light and not to be compared to the electric light of original genius besides the student who follows sir joshua's advice may begin by honestly attempting to paint his picture in the style of raphael without downright imitation of the figures but he soon learns to adopt raphael's attitudes raphael's expression and even raphael's mannerisms he becomes in short a mere copyist if this be deplorable in the case of the imitator of raphael how much more deplorable is it to adopt the modes of thought and expression of an inferior master it may be thought by some that in these lectures i often speak disrespectfully of the old masters but it is certainly not my intention so to do i have the greatest respect for many of them though not for all but i respect nature and truth still more and it appears to me that the true artist should go to the fountain-head for his ideas and inspiration and not to second-hand sources it may be answered that it is all very well saying that an artist should go to nature and rely on his own powers of creation and invention but supposing he is relying on a broken reed suppose he cudgels his brain in vain for ideas what is he to do in this case i should advise him instead of borrowing from the old masters that he should turn his attention to portrait painting landscape or some branch of the profession where the creative and imaginative faculties are not much required he may have great imitative power with a dexterous execution he may be a charming colorist or again he may be a refined and accomplished draughtsman and yet be totally unable to give dramatic vitality to a scene he has not himself witnessed it has always been the fashion to apply the term high art to heroic or scriptural figure subjects but i think there is almost as much high art in a noble portrait of titian or a fine landscape by claude as in any historical painting whatever i object to the term altogether but if it means anything it ought to mean a dignified and poetic view of nature in contradistinction to a trivial or prosaic view it ought certainly never to be applied to a pasticcio of the old masters however plausible such an imitation may be in my opinion there is high art in turner's early pictures because in them we get the man's own poetic interpretation of nature but in those works where he attempts to rival claude i can see nothing but the labour of a skilful imitator i have wandered away from the proper subject of this lecture and have but little time left but before concluding i should wish to explain that although i am continually urging the extreme importance of originality in painting i do not mean forced singularity or oddity i mean by the word the expression of the painter's own sober ideas a sane man should produce sane works it may not be very powerful it may in no way recall michelangelo but it will have qualities of its own how charming simple and unaffected are flaxman's designs until he got inoculated with the sistine chapel lymph after this inoculation we notice at least i do a great change for the worse in his compositions to graft successfully the parent stem ought to have been of the same nature as the zion or graft now flaxman's nature was gentle and very appreciative of beauty and grace with such a nature he ought to have abstained from attempting the grand and the terrible if flaxman erred in grafting michelangelo's manner on his own what shall we say about blake flaxman was at any rate a good draughtsman but blake's ignorance of the first principles of drawing makes his michelangelo-esque imitations simply ludicrous the successful attempts which have been made of late years to rehabilitate blake and to elevate him into a kind of british michelangelo make me almost despair of high art in this country
i do not wish to speak contemptuously of blake as a poet but in his pictures even supposing he had grand ideas i cannot accept the will for the deed the frog in the fable had grand ideas when he wished to rival the ox in size and yet he only made himself ridiculous were i to express all i think about the blake revival i could hardly confine myself to parliamentary language i will therefore in closing my lecture simply protest to the best of my power against this strange infatuation end of lecture eleven Lecture 12 of Lectures on Painting by Edward Armitage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 12, Composition of Incident Pictures. In my last lecture, I treated the art of composition as applied to decorative or semi-decorative work, of work intended rather to cover a given wall space with noble and picturesque forms than to give a dramatic version of any particular incident my present lecture will be devoted to the composition and arrangement of figure pictures whether biblical historical or anecdotic whose object is to represent in the most forcible way any given incident we are far more particular now about the arrangement or what the french call the mise en scène of a picture than the old masters ever were we may not be able to paint like titian or correggio but we attempt an approximation to truth which they never did and not only is a modern historical painter more truthful about the costumes of his personages and the architecture of his backgrounds but in the disposition and action of his figures he honestly endeavours to represent the scene as it actually may have occurred when i say that the modern painter does this i mean that in my opinion he ought to do it i am quite aware that many artists prefer to look at nature through the spectacles of the old masters but it appears to me that all art should be in some measure representative of the age in which it exists when we come upon a romanesque umbrian venetian flemish or eighteenth-century work of art we can tell at a glance to what period it belongs and i think that our own time being one of original thought and research should in some measure be similarly reflected in our painting i have no objection to gothic architects repeating in modern buildings the narrow staircases the dim lighting and other inconvenient peculiarities of the style were they to give us large plate-glass windows and noble flights of steps they would cease to be gothic architects but i don't think that however much we painters may admire the old masters we ought to adopt their modes of composition when we know them to be the result of ignorance error or carelessness the present graphic method of treating figure pictures is of quite modern growth and the innovation extends to all kinds of subjects compare any of giulio romano's rubens or lebrun's battle pieces with those of raffe horace vernet or better still de neuville how unreal the old masters appear recall to mind the romans of david and his school and compare them with the best modern representations of roman manners and customs in the one case we may admire the noble drawing and even the classical lines of the composition but we are never transported back to the scene whereas in certain modern pictures we feel on much more intimate terms with the personages we fancy we are actually a spectator at the coliseum or a participator in a fete en team the realism of modern art is due partly to a greater knowledge of and a greater attention to costume architecture furniture and all the properties of the stage on which we place our personages but it is also due to our making truth a primary object an incident may be treated truthfully in fifty different ways but some of these versions of it will be dull some obscure and some vulgar and it is for the artist to select a rendering which though perfectly truthful shall be neither dull obscure nor vulgar as soon as he loses sight of truth he ceases to be a realistic painter he may produce a beautiful picture but it will partake more or less of what i call semi-decorative work it is sometimes very difficult to fix a boundary line between realistic and decorative painting to which class for instance belong the cartoons of raphael 
although designed for tapestry and therefore for decorative purposes there is too much truth and reality about them to allow of their being classed among purely decorative works whilst on the other hand we can hardly admit that they are like the scenes they are meant to represent the heads are italian rather than jewish or oriental and sometimes as for instance in the miraculous draught of fishes pictorial liberties are taken which are quite inadmissible in realistic work i may here observe that in this lecture i shall not use the word realistic in the bad sense in which it has generally come to be used the term is now generally employed to designate some ugly or offensive piece of reality which is prominently thrust upon our notice by the artist as when quintin matsys gives us wrinkled and abnormally ugly old men or when a modern french painter throws all his talent into depicting the thick viscosity of a pool of arterial blood reality is only in rare instances repellent and i can see no good reason for confining the word to these exceptional cases in historical or what may be called incident pictures the main object of the artist ought to be to tell his story forcibly clearly and pathetically we have seen that in work partaking of a decorative character the principal object of the designer should be to group his figures in a noble and picturesque manner to attend to his drawing and if possible to add the charm of agreeable colour to his work in realistic historical painting he has something else to occupy his thoughts he must by no means neglect the lines of his groups he must avoid disagreeable angles equidistant heads convergent lines where they are not wanted and all the other rocks and shoals on which many a composition has been wrecked but in addition to this he must tell his story truthfully and clearly much more latitude in the matter of arrangement may be allowed him than would be conceded to the painter of decorative subjects he may if he thinks fit huddle up all his figures into a corner of the canvas or he may place them all in the centre leaving the sides unoccupied in short he may take great liberties with the laws of composition provided always these liberties tend to assist in giving reality to the scene the more picturesque or melodramatic the subject the more he may depart from the usual rules of composition paul de la roche was i think the first of the numerous cohort of modern painters who have striven to combine truthful sentiment with pictorial fitness and of all his works the assassination of the duc de guise is perhaps the most striking the arrangement of this picture is as dramatic as it is truthful on one side of the picture we have the murdered duke lying on his back stone dead the group of assassins are quite separated from their victim and are giving themselves no further trouble about him and yet the greatest ignoramus who knew nothing whatever about the story would have no hesitation in divining it so graphically is the incident told again if we recall to mind another and a better known picture by the same master i mean that known as les enfants d'adois we find the same subtle taste displayed i may here note that the colour of neither of these pictures is in any way remarkable indeed that of the princes is positively bad being very purple and inky but their enduring popularity rests on a more solid foundation than mere colour it rests entirely on their truthful and poetic treatment i call the treatment poetic because a dull prose reading of both these subjects would have represented the murders as actually being committed whereas by choosing the moment in the one case immediately after the murder and in the other just before the artist avoids all the stabbing hacking and smothering business and increases rather than diminishes our interest in the victims jerome's a death of caesar is another example of novel treatment of a hackneyed subject he also represents the deed as done the conspirators have sneaked off the benches of the senate house are all but deserted the only occupant being a very fat senator who is fast asleep on one of the benches somewhere near the centre of the amphitheatre how much more empty the senate house looks with this portly old roman snoring on his bench than it would do if entirely deserted i do not wish to lecture on modern pictures but i mention this death of caesar by jerome as an instance of a happy departure from the usual treatment of the subject 
indeed it appears to me that all assassinations martyrdoms executions and such like subjects if painted at all should be approached in some roundabout way the action of stabbing cutting a head off or sending a bullet through a man's body is instantaneous and although an executioner with his drawn sword and uplifted arm about to decapitate his victim may be startling and sensational at first sight yet after a time the feeling of horror or of pity gives place to a sort of impatience that he is so long before striking the blow one of the orleans princes had a picture of a military execution which he admired very much at first by and by however he got tired of it and ultimately sold it or gave it away not because it was too much for his feelings but because he was heartily sick of seeing the squad taking aim day after day and month after month and never firing although the best modern masters of dramatic composition have probably been guided by sentiment rather than by rule still a few observations on the treatment of certain subjects may not be out of place in this lecture thus if the subject be a departure of pilgrims or emigrants the figures should be placed on that side of the canvas which is opposed to the direction in which they are going if it be an arrival they should be placed on the side opposed to the direction whence they came in both these cases the large portion of canvas without figures is not wasted it assists materially in telling the story in the first case it represents the journey to be undertaken and in the second the journey just performed if we had to paint a shipwrecked sailor who has just reached the shore we ought to let very little of the shore be seen but plenty of raging sea here the interest of the subject lies in the formidable dangers he has escaped so we ought to devote the greater portion of our canvas to the breakers and relegate our mariner and the bit of slippery rock to which he is clinging to a corner if on the other hand we wish to represent our shipwrecked man clinging to a spar in the open sea with no land visible we ought to place him right in the middle of the canvas so as to give the impression of hopeless isolation and if we wished to convey the idea that he might possibly be rescued we would paint a sail on the horizon and near the edge of the picture i should place it near the edge in order that it might appear to have just come in sight and that hope of rescue was dawning if we were to put the same vessel in the middle of the picture and bearing down upon the drowning man we might feel equally certain that he would be saved but the effect would hardly be as dramatic again let us suppose that we have an elongated space to fill and that the subject is a fugitive escaping where ought we to place him on the canvas if we place him in the middle he will look too much like a professional runner doing his ten miles within the hour and we should feel inclined to pull out our watches and time him supposing him to be running from right to left if we place him near the right side of the picture we shall not know whether his pursuers are not close at hand and as our sympathies are always with the fugitive whether he be a prisoner of war a convict or a fox we should be glad to see him safe over to the other side of the picture if we place him near the left edge our wish is gratified there is now the whole width of the picture intervening between him and any sign of pursuit and we feel naturally though perhaps illogically that he has a better chance of escape the word artful has come to signify cunning and is always taken in a bad sense but i suppose that originally it meant literally full of art full of that curious compound of observation good sense and poetic feeling which is so noticeable in raphael poussin and all the great masters of composition in the examples i have given you there has always been some good reason for placing the figures on one side of the picture but where no good reason exists it ought not to be done it may not be out of place here to say something about the size of the figures in proportion to the canvas this is a very important element in the composition of a picture and many a good and careful work has been spoiled by the figures being either too large or too small for the canvas in these days when the general destination of pictures is to decorate dining-rooms or to fill small galleries space ought to be economized we should avoid as a rule large areas of background but on the other hand when the figures are too large for the canvas the effect is very unpleasant 
an erect figure with the head bent down should have space enough above it to allow of the head being raised otherwise the figure has an uncomfortable look as if she could not lift up her head without wrapping it against the frame indeed all stooping sitting or kneeling figures should have space enough allowed them to stand up in they should not in short look as if they had been put into those attitudes in order to pack them into the picture the mannerism of introducing figures too large for the canvas originated probably from the old german masters of the albert durer school with them however it was not a mannerism but a habit contracted by wood engraving in those early days the engraving tools were very rude and coarse moreover the blocks were small hence it became imperative to design the figures as large as possible and the habit thus acquired spread to drawings and pictures when on the other hand the figures are too small the picture generally looks stagey as if the artist had taken his composition from some genteel comedy scene at a theatre cases frequently occur where it is desirable to keep the figures small as in a caravan march across the desert or in a procession moving down a cathedral nave in the one case it is desirable to give an idea of the boundless waste of sand and in the other the architecture of the cathedral is probably more interesting than the individual action of the priest composing the procession and therefore the figure should be very small for the canvas as to the actual dimensions of the figures in historical or genre subjects there is only one size which i think objectionable and that is rather smaller than life figures of four and a half or five feet high seldom look well half life size or rather more is a very good proportion and any size below this down to the microscopic figures of bruegel or meissonier is equally good in my former lectures on composition i gave you several examples of the kind of mental analysis which ought to be brought to bear on every subject you wish to design it will i think be unnecessary to go through all this again as you are i trust more skilled in the art of composition than you were five years ago nevertheless it may not be unprofitable to some of you if i work out again one or two of my old subjects one of the themes i selected was from exodus when moses was grown he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an egyptian smiting an hebrew and he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man he slew the egyptian the subject to be the first part of the quotation that is where moses is watching the egyptian smiting the hebrew very well now there are two distinct centres of interest in this subject one is the brutal treatment of the hebrew by his taskmaster and the other is the indignation of moses under any circumstances it would be advisable to sacrifice one of those centres of interest to the other but the context absolutely prohibits all idea of uniting the three figures together in one group moses was certainly not visible to the two men we must therefore allow a considerable space between the figures and the question now arises which is to be our foreground group either mode of treatment seems to me equally good but supposing i fancy making the moses the principal figure in the picture how am i to express what is passing in his mind the other two figures will be in violent action therefore it will be well to represent moses in a quiet attitude but with an expression of concentrated indignation about him i just hastily sketch an erect figure any indication of a human figure will do to represent moses i have some ideas floating in my mind about making him clutching at his dagger and about the expression i will throw into his eyes and so on but for the present i leave all this alone and occupy myself with the general arrangement of the picture i find that with my erect figure of moses it will be better to make the picture an upright one and it will be necessary to make him in hiding or partly concealed by some building otherwise he would be in full view of the egyptian and i should not be in keeping with the word spied of the text i therefore put in a line or two to represent a building behind which he might be hiding now for the two men i don't at present elaborate the group at all 
i think the most natural reading is to suppose the israelite on the ground having fallen under his burden and the egyptian standing over him and beating him but for the present i make a kind of scrawl which might mean anything i do not quite like the place i have put it in i rub it out and shift it i am better pleased with the place now but the group looks too large i rub it out again and make it smaller now i find the moses is not quite in his right place i shift him about until i get him right and here let me point out the great advantage of a rough indication at first had i drawn my principal figure carefully with all the expression i meant to convey i should have hesitated about rubbing him out and my composition would eventually have suffered designing a subject is like drawing a figure in figure drawing you do not begin at least you ought not with sketching the eyes nose and mouth it is sheer waste of time to do so as the chances are ten to one in favour of your having to shift the head or to alter its inclination you make a simple oval with a line down the centre to indicate the inclination and then you go on with the rest of the figure if you have to change the head you can do so in two or three strokes the same method applies to the hands and feet students will often draw the fingers and toes and when the master comes round he finds that the hands and feet are in their wrong places and the work has to be done again never begin the detail of a figure until you feel sure that everything is in its right place and that the general proportions are correct in the same way in composition never begin to elaborate the figures until you feel sure that your groups are in their right places and of the proper size to return to our subject i will suppose now that i have got my figures where i want them to be i can go ahead now in all confidence i can try various attitudes for my striking and prostrate figures i can try different modes of giving to moses the kind of expression i wish him to have i stick to the ground plan of my design and also to the general features of the arrangement but i select my details as i go on now let us suppose that i have elected to take the other view of the subject in this case the picture would be reversed that is the struggling figures would be in the foreground and the moses behind i proceed always in the same manner i make a very rough indication of my two figures an indication which need not define either arms bodies or legs but which gives me an approximate idea of the size and general shape of the group this being done it remains to place the moses it is clear i must not put him very far off or his action and expression would be lost on the other hand i must not place him very near or the interest would be equally divided between him and the other figures i might perhaps by merely introducing his head with a pair of angry eyes glaring at the egyptian do something which would be original and telling and in this case with the head only seen he might be quite close to the struggling group all these different versions of the subject should be carefully considered before i finally adopt any one of them but when once i have made my choice i ought to stick to it there will be plenty of modifications to carry out in the individual action of the figures without again disturbing the general arrangement of the picture another of my illustrations of the reasoning an artist ought to bring to bear on his subject was the return of a crusader now here the first question which suggests itself is where shall we place our returning warrior on the road catching a first glimpse of his home on his threshold or fairly inside his house and surrounded by his family something may be said in favour of all three readings but if we place him at a distance on the road he will be alone or at least accompanied only by a retainer or two and we shall lose the best and most pathetic element in the subject if we place him inside the house and surrounded by his family we shall certainly avoid the objection to the first treatment but i think that the best moment to choose is when he has just crossed his threshold with the open door behind him admitting that we place him here our first and most obvious idea would be to make him the centre of a group his wife clinging to his neck his children to his legs his old dog licking his hand and the ancient retainer blubbering for joy in a corner on second thoughts however it might strike us that this treatment would be a little theatrical 
it would savour too much of the tableau vivant could not something more true to nature and therefore better be devised let us remember that our crusader has not been away for merely a month or two on a foraging expedition he has been away for years the boy he left has become a young man the infant a young girl and she of course does not remember him at all time and the son of palestine have also changed him greatly his ruddy british complexion has vanished his hair is grizzled his polished armour is rusty and hardly holds together then again his arrival is totally unexpected he has not as a more modern warrior would have done telegraphed to his wife to expect him by the next train all these causes tend to make it probable that on presenting himself on his own threshold there would be a short period of uncertainty of suspense and of hope in the air before he would be fully recognized with the daylight at his back his face would be in the shade which would be an additional reason for his wife not rushing into his arms at once her face would of course be in the full light and ought to express a yearning eager hope this expression would be difficult to depict but all emotional expressions which are not downright sensational are difficult it is very likely that in this as in the other example i have given you i might when i came to the actual execution of the picture adopt a different moment of time and a different treatment to the one which at present seems best to me my object in giving you these illustrations is not so much to recommend this or that particular mode of treatment as to show you how you ought to examine a subject from every point of view before committing yourselves to one particular reading in the prize for design which is associated with my name i purposely gave a whole day or one-third of the time allowed for the competitors to examine the subject in all its aspects so as not to commit themselves hurriedly to a treatment of which they might repent when it was too late for finished pictures taking three months to paint one-third of the time would be too large a proportion to spend in making up one's mind about the general arrangement but even in this case i think that more time might often be advantageously devoted to the design and less to the execution than is generally done i cannot refer to these sketches without expressing my great satisfaction at the progress made within a very few years some of you probably recollect the first competition and will doubtless agree with me that not only are the prize sketches greatly superior to those of the first year or two but the general average is also very much higher now i don't suppose that taking the average you are a much cleverer set of students than your predecessors of six years ago and therefore the marked improvement of which i have been speaking is due entirely to your attention having been drawn to the very important and i may add attractive study of composition although a great advocate for this study i cannot say i approve of sketching clubs as usually constituted experienced painters may perhaps join them with impunity their evening's contribution is always a faint echo of something they have done fifty times before but no good can come of any young artist cudgelling his brains to produce something original in two hours i don't think a professor of music would approve of his pupils meeting once a fortnight to improvise something on a given subject the result would be a farrago of stolen melodies and borrowed passages which would not lead to any good he who had the best memory and the cleverest execution would carry off the honours of the evening the original genius if there happened to be one present would be nowhere the same kind of thing would happen in a sketching club the thoughtful and fastidious members would become discouraged and perhaps give up composition altogether i think that friendly artistic gatherings are not only very enjoyable but very useful a man who systematically keeps aloof from all his colleagues generally deteriorates but the object of these gatherings should be the interchange of ideas and not the production of crude hasty sketches an historical or figure painter ought in addition to his knowledge of the human frame 
to study the connection between mind and expression and to steer a middle course between the facial monotony of giotto or cagna and the early masters and the grotesque grimacing of the montaigne school the works of lebrun and lavatier on facial expression are ridiculous and useless indeed nature is the only book we ought to consult if we wish truly to depict the effects of anger fear love and all the other human passions instead therefore of extending my observations in this direction i will return to the proper object of my lecture and give you a few more hints about the arrangement of a picture many artists in designing historical or what i call historical incident pictures prefer oblique to parallel perspective there are reasons for and against this practice and i am far from condemning oblique perspective in every case but i think that speaking generally the simpler method is preferable oblique perspective has the merit of being more picturesque and less formal but on the other hand it is less easily understood and although perfectly correct often gives a figure picture a lopsided look in every picture the horizon should be either above or below the centre of the canvas and not bisected into two equal portions this is evident enough in landscape painting but the reasons for observing this rule in figure pictures particularly in those where the scene is the interior of a room and no horizon is visible are not so obvious practically however it will almost always be found desirable to place the horizon considerably below the centre similarly the point of sight which in parallel perspective would of course coincide with the vanishing point should not be in the centre of the picture unless indeed the subject happens to be one of the severest kind it should be nearest to that side of the picture from which the light comes suppose the figures in a picture to be lighted from the left of the spectator and that the picture is hung in its proper light you would not stand exactly opposite the centre of the canvas to get a good view you would naturally place yourself a little on the side whence the light comes hence it is desirable that the point of sight should also be on that side where the perspective is parallel the eye is not at all shocked when the point of sight is fairly out of the picture indeed in pictures which represent a small area the effect is more agreeable when the lines converge toward a point outside in the determination of all these points as also in settling the height of your horizon you must allow yourselves to be guided by the nature of your subject what is right in one case is wrong in another in a prometheus bound you might with great propriety place your horizon below the picture altogether here quite at the bottom of the canvas you see the peaks of high mountains the real horizon would therefore be a long distance below it would not be impossible to suggest subjects where the horizon would be above the picture but i have probably said enough to show that exceptional subjects must be exceptionally dealt with beginners when they have a subject of several figures to paint will often find it of great assistance to make a small clay model of the whole design and to clothe their little figures with rags of different shades until they get an effect which they think will do the figures would be mere rough clay sketches just enough to give an idea of the proportions and attitudes the rags should be wetted with clay water and then the folds when dry will become quite stiff so that the figures can be moved about without disturbing the arrangement of drapery this plan is particularly applicable whenever the scene of the picture is a confined room or cell with a strong concentrated light over the board on which your little figures are standing you put an empty box or packing case and you cut a hole in the side of the case to represent the window if you find the light on your group too concentrated you can enlarge the hole or cut a small aperture on the opposite side so as to diffuse the light in lamp or firelit subjects this maquette method is most valuable you admit no daylight into the box but you place a small lamp or night light wherever you wish the fire to be and you have nothing to do but to copy the effect you must of course bore a small spy hole at the point of sight 
in my early days in paris when pictures were painted and not single figures for the market almost every young artist had his little puppet show into which he was continually peeping during the progress of his work some of the pictures thus painted were badly composed some were clumsily executed some were crude in colour but all had a truthful look about them as far as light and shade were concerned the real shadows the reflected light and the half-tones were all in their right places and of the right value when a man has been painting pictures for twenty or thirty years he knows pretty well what his effect ought to be under certain conditions he knows when he may venture to copy the effect of light on the model before him and when he must depart from it but the beginner has no experience to guide him and i would strongly recommend him to try the little clay figures the whole group of say ten figures could be modelled in two days the legs of those which are to be clothed in flowing drapery need of course not be indicated at all and the roughest approximation to nature in the attitudes is all that is necessary provided effect only is wanted of course if you wish to study drapery from your small figures you will have to elaborate them with greater care and probably have to make them larger than would be convenient for the other purpose another advantage of pursuing this method is that it gives a little practice in modelling and i think that every figure painter ought to be able to give expression to his ideas in clay just as well as on canvas there is no necessity for his learning to work out detail in the clay he need never model nose eyes or mouth and still less fingers and toes but he ought to be able to give proportion and action to a small clay figure just as easily as he would sketch with charcoal on a sheet of paper before i have done with my little clay figures i think it right to caution you against relying too implicitly on the effects of light and shade of your miniature figures they are intended to serve as aids but not as models to be servilely copied when copied too closely the shades are generally too black and there is an absence of half-tones which gives rather a harsh look to the picture an ingenious fellow-student of mine improved on the method by rigging up a light semi-transparent canvas box instead of the wooden one he cut the usual opening to admit the light and the canvas sides of the box let in just daylight enough to take away all unnatural blackness from the shadows it may be asked why have a box at all why not model the little figures clothe them and put them on your studio table in the first place the light you require for your picture may be dissimilar to the light of your studio and secondly one of the principal advantages of the box system is that the sides of the box represent the sides of the hall or room of the picture so that you see at a glance how the shadows of the groups are cast you see which portions of the figures stand out dark and which light against the background in short you get a much more complete idea of what you propose painting than you could possibly manage in any other way for out-of-door subjects where the light ought to be generally diffused this method is altogether inapplicable but for any prison catacomb or cloister scene it will be found extremely useful in a composition of several figures you will after arranging your groups often find large portions of the ground or floor space unoccupied don't be in a hurry to fill up these spaces with unmeaning accessories they are sometimes most valuable as giving rest to the eye and ought often to be preserved at any rate they ought never to be filled up promiscuously with objects which do not assist in telling the story i remember when i was a student we had a stop-gap always ready in the shape of a pot of some sort or other if joseph was being sold by his brethren and there was an awkward corner in the foreground we would put in a water-pot the egyptian merchants who bought him would be sure to carry large pots with them if aeneas was escaping from troy with his father on his back there would certainly be a large amphora in the corner supposed to be too heavy for him to carry the captive jews could not wail by the waters of babylon without a whole set of pots occupying the nooks and corners of the composition <laughs>
now an oriental water-jar or an etruscan vase may be beautiful objects and nice things to paint but this is no reason why they should be invariably used as stop-gaps in a subject like hagar in the desert the empty water-bottle is an essential element in the story or again in rebecca at the well you may paint pots to your heart's content but in subjects where they are out of place it is best to refrain if you possibly can all stop-gaps are very objectionable and if i mention this particular kind it is because it is the one usually resorted to i do not by any means wish to imply that you are to leave a disagreeable vacant corner unoccupied but whatever you put in it whether it be some cast-off cloak fruit or flowers dog or cat or even the irrepressible jar it ought not to look as if it had been purposely put there to fill up the hole doubtless it would be put there with that intention but the artifice ought not to be readily detected my main object to-night has been to impress upon you that in designing figure subjects you are not to take the first commonplace ideas which may occur to you but to reason your subject out and select whatever treatment you think most telling by so doing you are on the only true high road to originality there is a kind of originality or rather eccentricity which may be easily enough attained by ignoring the natural laws of action of light and of colour but i am speaking of originality united with excellence this i am convinced is seldom if ever attained by sitting idle and waiting for some happy thought to turn up you must use your brains constantly from the first charcoal sketch down to the finishing touches on the exhibition walls before closing this course of lectures i should wish to disclaim any desire of imposing my individual opinions upon any of you like every one who has thought a good deal about painting and painters i have formed my own ideas and have i think expressed them pretty freely but it would be quite contrary to my theory of free thought in art that you should accept as proven all the opinions i have expressed art as i have already observed is not a science i cannot take up the white chalk and prove to you by x plus y that my views are right and all others wrong what would become of our friends the critics if this could be done but although all assertions on art must be mere expressions of individual opinion it appears to me that the professor of such a many-sided art as painting is better employed in giving his honest convictions whether they coincide or not with the prevalent opinion of the day than in prudently confining himself to dry history or hazy aesthetics end of lecture twelve end of lectures on painting by edward armitage